So, my name is Gil. I'm PhD, third year international student at Portsmouth University School of Art, Design and Media. My interest is the process of art making, so I'm interested to see how art is produced. I'm not looking at the final product, that is to say, the final artifact, the final painting, and trying to understand the work of artists through the painting. I don't do that necessarily, but I'm taking one step back and I'm trying to understand what is the process by which artists are inspired through the creativity of art, through the making of art. Now, the idea of inspiration is not new, but it's really problematic because it is intangible. You cannot touch inspiration, therefore you cannot show it. So it's therefore very difficult to communicate it. Some people would disagree that there is such thing as inspiration. So I'm making work of art as part of this PhD, which visualizes this process of inspiration. Now if we're thinking about inspiration, we're thinking uh, mainly about the discussion of irrational and emotional within the rational practice. So the literature is trying to tackle inspiration to try to understand how element of irrationality, how element of emotions, actually works within the rational practice. And I was trying to take the idea of irrational and to make a small uh, installation exhibition where I took bowls of water, three simple bowls of drinking water, nothing funny, I put three walls, <laughs> one wall beneath each bowl. One says calmness, the other says love, and the third says fear. And I was asking people to come and to test the water, what the water feels like. And people were invited to test calmness, to test fear, and to suggest if they feel any, any differences. And indeed, people would tell you that calmness is much more smooth. There is much more text to, to feel. <laughs> now, Jung, Carl, Jung, Carl Jung, the Swiss psychologist, he takes this idea further by talking of a collective unconsciousness. So he said, if there is a rational something there which operates before the rational, if there is something, Carl Jung called it the collective unconsciousness. And he said this is something which is shared by all people, actually, the collective unconsciousness. And he said something else. He said that this collective presents itself through symbol, through actual shapes and images. And I was trying to make a film that illustrates the idea of the a priori categories, the source of inspiration that flow through the poet. <laughs> The romantic, the English romantic poet indeed accepted that notion of inspiration which is beyond any scientific understanding and they were also trying to visualize it. The next work by William Blake, this is actually the creator contemplating his own creation. Now the main problem, the main issue that I've observed with the literature about the English romantic poet is that they would usually tell you that the romantic poet themselves were inspired to three factors. One, dramatic historical event that the poet, the artist, observed in his life, like the French Revolution, the time of William Blake, the American establishment. The other psychological issue, mainly the English romantic poet are described as crazy people. And the third is family issue. Many of the English Romantic poets are described as people that had some family problem at their childhood. <laughs> and this is what uh, the literature think, believes that uh, cause or uh, expand the inspiration that the English Romantic perceive. Now that is a bit problematic, because it tells you that you cannot have inspiration because you are a normal gentleman. You are all denied of inspiration in this room if you are normal people. What we try to understand is how inspiration is embodied through the artwork in order to help us to uh, take it further and help other people to take it further. So we have the great Piet Mondrian. So he is saying, I'm inspired by nature like the English Romantic poets. Indeed, I'm inspired. But I'm not, I'm not going to dis describe the subject and the mythological element, but I'm trying to abstract the nature. I'm going to abstract the reality. His most famous work is composition, where there is nothing from nature, although that was inspired by nature, there is only the, the basic element, the small line, the small color, the small shape, which consists, which make na nature and allow him to approach inspiration. So the romantic naturalization of inspiration in symbol and myth are abstracted. We even go further, we go to the Russian constructivist, constructivism movement with Rodenshko, which says something even greater. They say there is nothing at all to represent 
We don't need to understand anything. We just need to create and to make. That's what, what Jens call. Uh, this is basically a one canvas with red paint, another different canvas with yellow, and another one with look black, but that is blue. The whole canvas was completed with color. We do not represent anything with this wall, but the plane, the actual so surface of a painting, it's in itself a surface, a, a form. So we don't need to represent anything, we don't need to abstract anything, because the world itself embodies inspiration. It is a work of creation in itself. Since then, art or abstract art seem to lose connection with the viewer, it's because people will laugh at that. People don't understand it. So what I was trying to do next, I was trying to create another film, which is both aesthetically, film aesthetic, which could interest you as a, as a film, and also describe the process of inspiration. It's called Interview with Authorial Self, where a poet interviewed his own muse, his own inspiration. I'm, I'm honored to introduce my own <laughs> Authorial Self. Thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. The Authorial Self is my own higher creative self that which inspires me to write poetry. So you are my authorial self, my creative self, which is also me. Yes. So what is the difference between you and me? Well, you see, what is the difference between Gil who writes, Gil who runs, and Gil who likes to cook? But Gil who runs and who cooks and who works is things that I'm doing, activity. Whereas poetry is something that I am. I was born a poet. Mm -hmm. It's an activity. You see? Kandinsky was also trying to bridge the problem, uh, the problem of artwork, the artist and the audience, the viewer. Kandinsky in 1912, in his work, uh, concerned the spiritual in, in art. He was saying that basically, let's accept it, but there is something, there is matter, as he said, which is invisible to the human eye. And he defined it as an inner call. He said the connection to that matter is to an inner call that artists feel and think. Now, yes, gave us a great example of this uh, inner call. He wrote a book called A Vision, where he described his method of communicating or contacting this inner call. So I thought it would be a great idea to make another short film which describes such an inner call, such an experience of a visionary poet. As I was walking on the street, suddenly I felt light in me and around me, as if someone pushed me above the water from deep within. I said, God, he answered, I'm not God, and any word limits me. Oh well, Lord, I'm not your Lord, nor I am a peasant. All that is, oh that's better. I felt light, almost weightless, both in my body and mind. Does the atom ask the molecule who creates what? It does not. Instead, they just play together. The element of the emotion is what artists seem to be very much focused on. And that is really how they are opening up to inspiration. So I thought to tackle that uh, point of emotion and make a short film. Excuse me, can I ask you what is love? What is love? What is love for me is I love you. I love is a... Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Good question. Love is very essential. Caring for somebody else, I suppose. Everything. I don't really know what love is. Yeah. Uh, don't know. That's a difficult one. The bond between a man and a woman. Excuse me, can I ask you what is love? <laughs> 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 <laughs>